Thank you for choosing Access On Demand. Access believes in continuing education, and we create content to empower you to learn and grow anytime, anywhere. Let's get started. Hello. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We are delighted to be partnering with the Accreditation Commission for Healthcare to share best practices for supporting patient care during challenging times. My name is Molly Casey. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Access. Before we get started, let me tell you a bit about ACHC. ACHCU is the Educational Division of the Accreditation Commission for Healthcare, a national accrediting organization known for providing value, integrity, and the industry's best customer service. With a comprehensive suite of resources designed to help the healthcare providers excel in their fields and prepare for accreditation, ACHCU offers program-specific materials, including workshops, workbooks, and webinars. Access is a leading home healthcare technology company offering a complete suite of easy-to-use innovative software solutions, empowering home health, home care, and hospice providers to grow their business while making lives better. Today, you will hear from Lisa Meadows and Andrew Awani. Lisa has over 25 years of experience in the healthcare industry from acute care, hospitalization, home health, to hospice and palliative care. Lisa is currently the Clinical Compliance Educator for the Accreditation Commission for Healthcare, where she provides comprehensive clinical accreditation in industry education to ACHC customers and stakeholders, and assists providers with interpreting the ACHC standards and Medicare condition, conditions of participation. Dr. Andrew Awani is the Director for Patient Engagement and Access. He has worked across the continuum of care with interdisciplinary teams to improve clinical, financial, and operational outcomes utilizing process improvement and information technology. He leads the patient engagement team at Access, working with professionals across the U.S. on improving their engagement with patients through, the, through CAP surveys and other tools and processes. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. Your phones have been muted, but you may submit questions through the chat function. We will be posting the slides in the chat function area. And after the webinar today, we will follow up with a link to the slides, as well as a recording of the webinar itself. Please feel free to submit questions through the chat functionality, and we will respond to you after the webinar. Um, the webinar itself and the slides will also be posted on the Access and ACHCU websites. Lisa and Andrew, over to you. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so Molly. Thank you, Molly. We really appreciate that warm introduction, and we want to welcome everyone again, and thank you so much for spending some time. Lisa and I are extremely excited to speak to this topic of exceeding patient expectations during COVID-19, and we know we will get through this uh, and beyond. And so at this time, we'll go over our objectives. So our objectives for today's presentation, we're going to review some of our current patient care challenges and then identify best practices for supporting patient care during these challenging times and outline key patient-centered steps organizations can implement short-term and long-term during this crisis. So Andrew, I'll turn it over to you. So we wanted to open up with a thought and the thought really is all of us are here um, at this time because we committed to caring for patients, ensuring that they continue to receive the best care possible, uh, rain or shine, pandemic or not. And um, this quote by the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease, Dr. Fauci, um, jumped out at us because the idea is we can't compromise our principles. Um, otherwise, we're lost, really lost even at times like this. And what we're hoping to do is to talk through some of the challenges our patients are having um, and really highlight some of the things that we've already been doing and that we know we need to continue to do, not just to get past this, but to thrive through it all. And our patients are counting on us. We know that CMS 
uh, is focus on patient-centered care. Um, there are a number of different quotes, um, a number of different bulletins that um, have come out. And the idea is to, in order to truly transform our healthcare system, is to empower patients to become um, the consumers of healthcare that they need to be and to give them all the tools that they need. So we know that what we're doing is we're part of our patients' teams in really driving the care that they're receiving. And um, we know that this is CMS's focus, uh, and there are a number of different measures to that effect, uh, one of which we'll talk about towards the end. We know that in order for a patient to truly be empowered in their care, because patients are along a continuum in terms of their level of empowerment, and that fluctuates over time, they need to be surrounded by uh, a care team. And the care team also needs to be part of a cohesive organization that supports them in the delivery of care. Obviously, there are many different layers, but outside organizations, there are all kinds of different um, forces at work as well that support organizations um, and that also uh, serve as headwinds. But through it all, we know whether it's regulatory or market uh, policy or whatever is going on, um, organizations really need to be there in order to be able to support the care teams that will then support those patients. And so our goal is really to speak to some of the different aspects um, that need to be in place in order for patients to be supported at the various uh, levels. So we were looking at some numbers. I think it goes without saying that the majority of patients that we take care of, um, in the Medicare space at least, uh, are older than 65, and a number of them um, are older than 60 um, when, when you look at um, how that ends up being parsed out. And this is the demographic breakdown from a male-female perspective as well as race and ethnicity. So um, that's not new, but of particular interest is the age, and that's why we included that. When we look at the top eight measures, uh, selected measures around the Medicare population, um, we know that the majority of them have multiple chronic conditions and they have financial challenges. And um, when we look through the list, that's really um, where most of our patients fall into. We couple that with the coronavirus or the COVID-19 pandemic, and we realize that unfortunately, um, our patients are also targets um, from the COVID-19 um, pandemic in terms of the death and disability that they um, endure because of it. And so we know that our patients have COVID-19 top of mind because the new cycle ensures that they don't forget that um, as much as we continue to support them. So when we look at the CDC uh, numbers around this, we can see that even here in the U.S., looking at um, admissions uh, and discharges that uh, took place and death um, that took place between February 12th and March 16th of this year, the majority of uh, hospitalizations um, and deaths occurred in that Medicare population. And so um, we know, again, our population is fairly vulnerable. So what do they have to say from an opinion perspective? We looked at uh, the, uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, they've been running a coronavirus poll uh, since February. These numbers um, uh, ac uh, actually reflect um, the latest survey, which took place between March 25th and 30th. And we do have a few slides that compare the previous survey, which took place in the first part of March. But essentially, it was a national a uh, representative random sample pulled from about 1,200 adults 18 years and older. They also included 293 respondents who had previously participated in a survey 
um, that they've done over the last nine months and was done here in the U.S., including Alaska and Hawaii. Um, we just selected a few findings um, that are pertinent to our discussion this morning um, or this afternoon. When we look at um, the economic impact of um, the majority of these patients um, or these individuals, um, because it's a nationally representative survey, we know that our patients feel the same way. Um, we didn't have the breakdown. Uh, look forward to being able to share with that with you on uh, a later presentation. But we see that they're concerned about the economic impact and their health, um, whether it's putting themselves um, at risk um, or their family at risk or the fact that they can't um, afford financially um, the testing or treatment or um, due to the economic impact from not being able to be out there as well. There's a mental health component as well. And um, the bar graph on top was the survey that was taken between March 11th and the 15th. And we see that 32% um, during that survey period uh, felt worry or stress related to COVID-19 and that it had a negative impact on their health. The second um, bar graph there shows the March 25th through the 30th poll, and we see that that's increased. So essentially, concern around the COVID-19 um, pandemic continues to weigh on the minds of the general population and definitely on the minds of um, our population. And we can see here um, that same data broken out um, by the demographics that we had shown earlier. So suffice to say, um, our patients uh, are concerned um, and it is impacting their mental health. And that's part of why Lisa and I um, felt the need to really speak to this topic in our organizations, to speak to this topic around how we can um, continue to leverage the skills that we have in the in-home care setting in order to not only do what we've always done, but really to step up um, at this moment when our patients are truly looking forward um, to us being able to not only meet their needs, but really exceed it. We included this slide just to highlight the fact that the average course um, of um, the coronavirus to recovery um, on average, it takes about 24 days. And so what this tells us is um, we know that there are a number of hotspots all over the country, um, and we understand that um, each area will have a very different um, cycle. But overall, we know at some point we will see uh, COVID-19 patients um, show up in the home care setting, especially in areas where the surge is fairly um, sharp in its peak, and there will be a need um, for patients um, who need more acute care to be in hospitals, while those uh, that are either recovering or, or need least, uh, less acute care will move to the home setting. So we know at some point we will be dealing with um, this. We wanted to move next into um, really talking about how we can begin to think of some of the short-term and long-term um, impact to this and some of the changes or the things that we need to have in place. We recognize that everyone is in a different part of the country. Um, our hearts go out to um, our colleagues in New York, uh, Louisiana, Michigan, uh, and the Illinois area in California and some of the other really hard hit areas. And we recognize as well that um, some of the organizations on this call are doing some of these things, but we wanted to go over them in terms of the overall health of the organization. We know without an organization in place, the care team cannot be supported. Um, this happens to be the groupings for some of the areas that um, we've identified as best practices as we've talked to customers um, and interacted um, and really um, sought some of the best practices. And so everything from leadership to um, patient support. 
So if we start with leadership, we know that um, this is an opportunity for leadership. We've heard it. Um, we know it. We know during times of crisis, leadership is absolutely important for success. And so um, the leadership of our healthcare organizations um, really recommitting to the vision, mission, uh, and reinforcing the culture. Um, and for those who have continued doing that, um, this has just been an opportunity for them to um, to review that and put it fully into practice. For those who haven't, it's an opportunity for them um, to go back to their why. We know that it's important for um, visible support of incident management at all levels, ensuring that there's uh, a clear understanding of the COVID-19 um, virus and best practices around managing that. There's a lot that's been put out um, in that area. And so um, we're just highlighting some of those. The uh, communication and messaging is absolutely uh, critical, both internally with employees and externally with our patients, our partners, and other stakeholders. Um, we need data, um, being able to understand exactly what's going on in our area of the country around infection rate patterns um, and what the impact will be is required by leadership. And then really looking at strategies that are being implemented. Not all strategies will work for every organization. There's a need to really look at um, what strategies are working and that fit for our organizations um, with where we're at. And then obviously protective um, Personal protective equipment is absolutely uh, crucial, working with our um, suppliers, um, and we know that um, it's becoming better, um, but there's still challenges in other areas. Leadership can put in um, a remote or telework infrastructure uh, and ensuring that they're supporting um, employees um, with um, those, as well as an incident management command center centralizing um, how um, we respond to the virus overall. And next we'll be and speaking if, around, go ahead. I was going to say, you were, um, I was jumping ahead. One of the things that leadership should definitely be looking at right now if you haven't already, is your emergency preparedness plan. As we know, both Medicare certified home health and hospice providers are required to have an emergency preparedness plan. And in 2019, CMS did then require that emerging infection diseases become part of their all hazard risk assessment. So your emerging infectious diseases, that section of your emergency preparedness plan may now require modifications. But one thing you definitely want to be doing, if you are in the midst of this right now, you have activated your plan most likely. You want to be documenting um, what you are doing. And if you have it, you want to be pulling out your plan right now to review. Next slide. So as I said, if you're if you're not in the midst of a COVID crisis in your area, it hasn't really hit your area yet, take your plan out now and review it. Do you have things in place to be able to provide patient care and to continue the operations of your agency? That's the two key components of an emergency preparedness plan, being able to continue operations as an organization and being able to provide care to your patients. And a key part of an emergency preparedness plan is also your staff having their own personal plan. You know, this is something that is um, different than we've ever experienced um, for any of us that are alive right now. Um, we've not been through a pandemic such as this. So you do want to make sure staff are able to have their own plan. They're going to be able to continue to provide care to your patients. What happens if there's a surge issue in your area, your agency is now um, receiving a lot of patients with COVID-19, or maybe they don't have COVID-19, but you're still experiencing a surge because hospitals are discharging patients 
from the hospital so they can care for those COVID patients. So it's not only just preparing from the COVID-19 standpoint, it's preparing from just a surge as those hospitals discharge. So also, as I said earlier, if you have implemented your plan, take this time and make sure somebody is documenting. Documenting what is happening, what's going well, what's not going well, and what your contingencies are, because you will need to revise that once we get through this crisis. The Office of Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Resort or in Response, known as ASPR Tracy, they do have a very extensive um, checklist. Um, it is the website is right there, www.askfortracy.hhs.gov, COVID-19. And there is a section specifically for home-based healthcare and hospice. So if you are a home health or hospice provider, there are excellent resources on Asper Tracy as it relates to your emergency preparedness plan and COVID-19. and infection control. And I was on um, a webinar earlier and one of my colleagues said, infection control will never be the same. And that is true. Um, it will never be the same again. It'll never be thought of as the same or delivered in the same capacity. But again, both Medicare and um, home health and hospice providers are required to have an infection control plan. It's spelled out in the Medicare conditions of participation. But even without that, that is still something that all quality home health and hospice providers um, would be practicing. You want to review your infection control policies. If you haven't done that, do that now. Again, some of this is going to be different based on to what level of experience you're having with COVID. Review your infection control education. It's been surprising to see the issues around, you know, the lack of PPE is definitely a concerning issue, but also the lack of understanding of how to properly use PPE, not only for your staff, more for patients and caregivers. You want to make sure that people understand how to properly put on their PPE and take off their PPE as well as dispose of it. And, you know, there's been a lot of um, stuff floating around social media, which isn't always the best place to get your your information, but there was someone who put a video on with gloves and showing cross-contamination is too many times lay people think because they have gloves on that they're now protected and they don't understand the need to change gloves frequently. So you want to make sure your staff and patients, caregivers all know how to properly use PPE. You also want to be tracking and reporting your infections. Not as this only something that you need to be doing from a regulatory standpoint, tracking any of those COVID patients. But that's part of the, the infection control. It's also part of your quality assessment and performance improvement. Make sure you're tracking these COVID infections. Any that you receive from the hospital or from a physician's office, as well as any patients that develop COVID-19 while they are in your care. And make sure you're not seeing the transmission of this from patient to patient due to poor infection control practices of your, of your staff. The stock of personal protective equipment has been something that has been readily on everyone's mind. ACHC recently did a survey and we asked people, you know, what their top concerns were. And two of the top concerns were, the number one concern was um, getting their hands on enough personal protective equipment. Um, another concern was about um, just the anxiety and the mental health around um, um, COVID-19 from not only the patients, but from their staff as well, which is something that we are going to touch on. So you do want to take stock of your PPE. You want to, again, as I said, make sure people know how to properly use PPE, understand when to use it, when not to use it, because in times of shortages such as this, you do want to make sure that people aren't overusing PPE and then therefore are being wasteful. And you want to make sure you have enough to last, you know, the, the time frame that you're going to need it. Um, one of the resources that you'll receive um, with the handouts as well is information that CMS released on the COVID-19 focused infection control survey for acute and continuing care Providers. So there's two documents um, that will be part of the handouts that if you 
um, especially if you're a hospice inpatient or a home health hospice provider providing care for COVID-19 and you do have a focused infection control survey, it just kind of breaks down exactly what the surveyor will be looking for. So you do want to use that document and make sure you're going to be able to demonstrate compliance with the infection control requirements if you were to have a focused infection control survey. And so um, when we look at um, the next area for organizations, ensuring that their, the financial health of the organization um, is in line with um, being able to continue to deliver exceptional care. So obviously financial modeling, really looking at um, the drop-off in patients in some cases, anticipated um, admissions um, from COVID-19, looking at partners, having those discussions, but essentially ensuring that the bottom line of the organization ensures that uh, employees and staff will know that the organization will continue to be there. So we know that um, during these times, without a strong balance sheet, um, patients cannot receive the care that they need. There are a number of federal and state financial uh, relief programs. Um, there's some excellent resources out there. Um, I know Access has some, and you'll find that a number of other industry um, leaders also have some great resources as to how to apply for any of these financial resources. Another aspect clearly is um, employees and staff. We know that without a care team um, with employees and, and staff, it's impossible for patients to be taken care of. And so um, reprioritizing or prioritizing employee well-being is absolutely crucial. Um, checking in with employees if that's not happened, both on a personal and family level, ensuring um, that the employees are doing well. And obviously not all, all organizations can do this, but if the organization's able to step in and either provide childcare or connect um, their employees to resources um, due to being impacted by the COVID-19 um, pandemic, um, that is important as well. The ability to um, utilize remote and telework capabilities, obviously, um, for clinical care providers who need to see patients, um, it might not be possible for them not to see those patients, but um, as we've seen with a number of waivers and other regulatory changes, the ability to use telehealth uh, continues to uh, unfold, and some organizations, and we'll talk about um, some of the things that some organizations are doing around that. Obviously, being flexible with employees um, regarding their work status and availability um, and working to schedule them um, as available. And then, um, as Lisa mentioned, the need for documentation, whether it's policies, um, making some adjustments to procedures, as opposed to a wholesale rewrite, um, we've dealt with uh, infection control. We know about infection control in the in-home care setting. And so um, we know that we need to make some adjustments to those policies and uh, continue to educate um, our employees and our patients about what it is we're doing around that and obviously ensuring that employees understand with those adjustments um, what they need to do. And then checking in with employees, uh, ensuring that they continue to do well because um, we uh, are also dealing with some of the same things that our patients are dealing with. The one advantage maybe we can say we have is that we have a lot more knowledge about um, caring for patients across um, a number of different care settings and we can bring that to bear um, with our patients as we work with them. Yeah, it is the time now to really be able to check in with healthcare providers. And um, as a social worker who has worked with nurses for over 30 years, I will say this out of love and respect. Um, a lot of the nurses I have worked with um, over the years are, are very um, uh, don't want to offend anyone, but they are they are 
you are individuals who, as nurses, tend to not talk a lot about feelings, as those of us who are in the social work field do. And a lot of nurses hold everything together because you have to. You have to demonstrate a level of competence and confidence to your your patients and family, and that's very admirable. But it's a time now to also, as leaders in your organizations, to touch base with your staff because fear and anxiety is prevalent. There's a lot of um, myths or untruths that are going around. You know, there's a lot of truth going around that in and of itself is anxiety provoking. So you need to touch base with your employers, your employees. You need to, as the leaders of your organization, you have to encourage and model self-care because we all know um, it's nothing, it's not, it's not rocket science, science, but we do have to take care of ourselves before we can take care of others. I mean, just the physiological aspects of being stressed and run down what that does to the immune system. And now's the time more than ever that um, as care providers, people need to be as strong as possible. But sometimes that has to um, be forced Um, It's not always something that comes naturally for people. Listen to the experts. I think one of the best pieces of advice that I've heard is listen to those in the white coats, meaning listen to the professionals, listen to the experts, limit your exposure. There are times I am a person who becomes a news junkie, social media junkie. You know, I'm getting up first thing in the morning, turning on the news to hear the latest or looking um, on social media. Um, and it was something that very similar to 9-11. People were just, um, their exposure to it was to the point where it becomes detrimental to your mental health. So there are times when you have to limit your exposure so that you don't become overwhelmed. And again, when you do expose yourself to information, try to um, limit that to listening to the experts. Make sure you know where that information is coming from. Encourage talk therapy. As I said in the beginning, I've worked with nurses my whole life. Um, Love my nursing colleagues, but encourage talk therapy. Sometimes just realizing we're not alone. And, you know, this is a global pandemic. It's nothing that any of us are living with in isolation. And encourage just talking about it. Sometimes as little as five, 10 minutes a day can relieve a lot of that anxiety. Be able to identify areas of control. This is the number one reason people experience anxiety and depression is because they feel they have lost control. And there is a lot of this that we don't have control of, but there's still a lot of areas that we do, we are able to maintain that control. So help yourself, help your family, help your employees realize what areas do I have control over this time? Be flexible when possible. Like Andrew said, nothing is being done as it's been done before. I mean, we're in a time um, that may, in in light of everything, be an opportunity as a provider to say, you know what, let's look at this differently. The work needs to be done. Maybe the work can be done from one to seven instead of nine to five or eight to five. You know, be flexible where you can, not only to ensure the work gets done, but also to help maintain um, some of that self-health care, mental health care for your employees and promote teamwork. This is the time for everyone to pull together um, based on individual um, circumstances that your people may be experiencing. You know, there may be the time that we have to lend a hand and, and jump in more. Um, for one colleague or another colleague has the opportunity to to do more than another because of their own personal circumstance. So this is the time that, you know, some of those things that we count, such as productivity and may not be the most important right now. What may be the most important is supporting one another, ensuring that quality care is being delivered and that we get through this crisis standpoint. And I agree with you, Lisa. As a nurse, I, I know we tend to put the needs of others um, in front of ours. Um, moving on to technology, um, we know that technology is absolutely crucial. We've all followed the stories around 
um, the load that uh, Microsoft and Zoom and a number of other vendors that um, are delivering um, data um, are experiencing. But selecting a technology partner that fully supports the COVID-19 response um, with everything from uh, screening and tracking patients and providers, um, really being able to enhance uh, intra-provider communication, secure messaging. Um, HIPAA has been waived, but clearly we don't want to fall into the habit of um, using technology that won't take us beyond where we're at. And so really um, also having uh, communication between providers and patients. Um, a technology partner that um, facilitates patient care documentation, makes it easy to capture all the things that Lisa mentioned. Um, we will get through this, and we know that uh, our documentation uh, will be one of those things that will be looked at um, for substantiating the actions we've taken for reimbursement uh, and a number of um, other things. Being able to um, really look at subpopulations and track them and manage them. Um, guidelines and reminders that are embedded in the system to make it easy for um, providers and in some cases patients to know which actions to take. Um, and letting technology do what it's good at, which is keeping track of triggers and um, data. Um, obviously, data is important for monitoring KPIs, um, for organizations being able to uh, track productivity, financial measures, clinical measures. Um, and obviously, uh, for those who are in rural areas, um, uh, mobile point of care is absolutely crucial, um, being able to do that offline. Um, and then um, we know that COVID-19 information is constantly changing. And so having um, resources and support that allow um, your, you and um, your organization and your uh, care teams to really have the most up-to-date information um, from the white coats, um, as Lisa mentioned. We know that um, we've talked about the organization, the care team, and obviously um, there's work that organizations need to do with continuing to prioritize patient care, checking in with patients. Um, when you have administrative staff that might be working from home, um, they can jump on the phone and call existing patients, follow up, um, and just do touch points just to see how they're doing and pass that information on as we continue to take care of our patients, even recently discharged patients. Um, if we have some downtime, being able just to follow up and just let them know that we care. Um, I'm sure that some of those calls uh, may come as a surprise, but it just shows that we truly um, do care for them. Obviously, um, the ability to provide telehealth uh, versus face-to-face -face visits, ensuring that our visits don't loop up. We know that um, there are industry organizations, uh, both at the state and national level, uh, like NAC, that are advocating um, for um, the use of telehealth and having it count. Um, but we know that we can use it in its existing forms for starts of care, uh, for um, the initial assessment. Um, and there are a number of great presentations around how to do that more specifically. And we'll mention a few here. Obviously, updating policies and procedures, uh, really educating our patients, as we've mentioned, around uh, COVID-19 um, and helping straighten out some of the misinformation that's out there and really speaking to what it is our organizations are doing to ensure that those patients remain safe. Um, and similar to our employees, really working with our patients to address what their issues are. We don't have to make it um, the top uh, topic of conversation because that might not be what really is concerning them. Um, obviously, we want to lead with their primary concerns, um, but as we know, um, the discussion around COVID-19 will come up, um, bubble up naturally, and we can address those. Um, and then we want to um, just remind ourselves that, you know, People really don't care how much we know um, about COVID-19 until they know how much we care um, about them specifically. 
So some of the patient care approaches that are likely to be changed during this time and even for the future um, are going to include some of these touch points here. Angie, if you want to go over those. And so, sure. Um, with the patient touch points, what we're really looking at is the points at which we have patient um, contact. Everything from the referral and intake all the way through discharge, and then the um, the times patients reach out to us and contact us. And so, um, each one of those patient touch points presents an opportunity to deliver um, exceptional care and to address whatever concerns those patients have. And some of those starting with your referral and intake. You know, as Andrew said, contact your patients by phone when possible. One of the things you definitely want to do is be screening for COVID-19 and making sure if you're receiving a patient from the hospital, you know, you do have the right to ask if they do have a diagnosis of COVID-19. But even if they don't come to you with that diagnosis, you do want to screen because you want to make sure your staff going out to the home are properly prepared to care for a patient who um, may be positive or suspected of um, COVID-19 because you want to be able to protect, again, your patients, but also your staff. You know, determining homebound status by record review or telehealth you know, and that telehealth has to be two-way audio visual communication. CMS, just as an FYI, did release um, a little video, a quick little video on what telehealth is and, and um, how to make sure you're doing it properly and coding it properly. So that's just something they did just, I believe, was yesterday. Um, ensuring your certifying physician includes orders for telehealth options for visits on your plan of care. So make sure, again, you... Your plan of care should reflect the care that you're visiting. So you want to make sure that it's incorporating those visits. Your admission and initial assessment, you know, identify those immediate care and support needs. Patients are having difficulties even getting some of their mobility aids for safety. DME providers are having a hard time with their supplies, not only from the PPE standpoint, but we've heard from our customers as well who are, you know, they're not able to get their shipments in. Um, you know, we've had an issue here at ACHC where we're not able to get some laptops in for new staff because so many people are working for home. So this has changed our environment in which we provide care in a way that we've not seen before. Medication, are they able to get their medication? What's available in their area? A lot of pharmacies are now doing deliveries, but if they're in a rural area, that may be harder for them to do. And of course, the issue with PPE, you know, if staff are having a hard time getting it, we know it's going to be difficult for our caregivers in the home and our patients in the home um, to get the appropriate PPE. So explaining to them how to make a homemade mask, um, proper hand washing, what does that mean? Proper cleaning of the environment, um, you know, being able to sanitize, being able to isolate a patient if needed, and educating that patient as well on signs and symptoms of COVID-19 and what they need to report to you as a provider. Routine visits. Go ahead. Routine visits, you know, scheduling those in person visits to prevent the lupus, as Andrew said, and utilizing appropriate PPE, um, utilizing telehealth where you can. You know, one of the things that have been waived with the 1135 waivers issued by CMS is the nurse aid supervisory visit. Um, can now be done, you know, through the telehealth capacity. You know, CMS is also trying to give home health and hospice providers the leeway in reducing unnecessary contact. Um, emergent situations, again, option to utilize telehealth to triage, complete in-person visit when you have the appropriate PPE and those restart visits as well. Option to use telehealth to perform um, the restart and do that in person when you have the appropriate PPE. 
discharging again, utilizing telehealth to conduct that discharge, um, only doing the in-person visit with the appropriate PPE and contacting um, the office. You know, you want to make sure um, that your COVID-19 screen is um, updated if negative um, and respond to any COVID-19 concerns. You know, the, the issue that we're seeing with COVID is um, a person may not present with symptoms right away, and it may be several days after exposure that they now start to demonstrate symptoms of COVID. And you want to make sure patients and families understand they need to call you with that information. They don't need to wait till you show up for a routine visit, um, not expecting a patient to now be showing symptoms of potential COVID-19. So encourage them to pick up that telephone and call you when things have changed. Um, and we, we went ahead and just included um, the screening um, criteria that uh, CDC has put out. And uh, just as, as a reminder um, for the fact that we wanna ensure that these are captured uh, and documented. And like Lisa mentioned, um, the fact that when we initiated CARE, um, they were negative doesn't mean that that might not change. And so obviously we want to keep track of the various screenings until we have um, additional testing that shows whether someone's been exposed or, or has antibodies to uh, the COVID-19 virus. And so with screening, um, it'll help us triage our patients. They really boil down into two main categories. Either they're asymptomatic um, in which case we want to screen on an ongoing basis and um, utilize standard precautions, or um, we're suspicious. Uh, either they become sy symptomatic, we're investigating, or they've actively been diagnosed uh, with COVID-19, uh, in which case we step up the kinds of PPE that we use. Again, this is territory that we understand as healthcare providers delivering care in the home, and so um, none of this is really new to us. We also wanted to speak to um, the patient self-management um, and really beginning to come full circle. So we started out really talking about patient-centered care, ensuring that patients are empowered to care for themselves um, and ensuring that they understand that we really are here to support them and we're not here to run their care. Patients most often um, deal with their uh, chronic condition or their chronic conditions uh, for 23, 24 hours of the day when we're not there. So our goal is to continue to support them in really um, um, working through the assessment goal setting um, and all to ensure that they can continue to manage and support their care. We included the self-management model. Um, it's uh, widely published. Um, none of this is probably new. Um, there, some of the labels might go um, by different names, but at the end of the day, what we're really doing is supporting the, the patient's personal um, action plan for how they want to remain healthy. Um, and you know, when we're assessing, um, we're looking at their beliefs, their behavior, their knowledge, we now need to include COVID-19 as part of that routine um, assessment, you know, uh, and working through um, really advising them, providing um, information around their risks, correcting information, agreeing with whatever goals that we've collaboratively set um, as they help us prioritize and we help them prioritize what it is they need to work on. And then assisting them along the way um, with blocking and tackling um, whether it's identifying personal barriers or um, helping them deploy resources that help them meet their uh, plan. And Lisa had also mentioned um, the idea around the locus of control for us as providers, ensuring that we understand um, where we're at on this continuum about locus of control. Locus of control really um, describing how we view our relationship and how our patients view their relationship with their environment and their ability to impact that. We know that um, it's a continuum. 
we move, our patients move, where there are times where we might feel powerless, what our patients are counting on us for is leadership and ensuring that we can help be that white coat in their lives to help bring that locus of control back to an internal locus of control. And how do we do that? It's by working with them on helping them understand the virus and breaking down what it is they need to do, like Lisa mentioned, when we're educating them, um, helping them um, also, instead of sitting around um, binging on news that talks about how dangerous it is out there, maybe it's an opportunity for them to begin to connect with um, people they haven't connected with before. Um, now that everyone is stuck at home, um, maybe it's an opportunity for them to spend some time or reach out to um, uh, kids or grandkids or great grandkids that haven't had the time of day to reach out to them. So it's essentially helping our patients to move back to an internal locus of control. The other um, concept is really self-efficacy, um, which is an individual's belief in their ability to um, really execute those behaviors um, that help them achieve the goals that they're looking for. What is their confidence in their ability to um, perform whatever uh, tasks they need to? And so um, from the model here, we can see that past experience, so there's an opportunity for us to remind them of the fact if they happen to have more of an external locus of control, that they've dealt with their disease very effectively. They've dealt with various challenges in their life and that they can overcome COVID-19. Um, their vicarious experience um, is similar um, in terms of looking at how other people, um, so sharing best practices with them, how other people their age have dealt with it, and social persuasion, um, being able to show them people who survived um, either a COVID-19 infection, we know it's terrible, um, and maybe um, it might be hard to come by some examples, but being able to help them understand that um, we will get through this as well. And obviously the physiological feedback, helping them understand um, as they go through some of the skills around the uh, use of PPE, um, that they will be able to um, truly um, adopt some of these skills um, to their existing skill set. And then obviously in our plans of care, we want to ensure that um, um, item five there, we're documenting their level of conviction and confidence, which is really um, speaks to their locus of control and their um, self-efficacy and ensuring that we can continue to um, support them. And just, you know, not to be the bearer of bad news, but as we know, COVID-19 is not going to go away. It is something that we will get through this crisis. We will no longer be in a pandemic. Hopefully it will never be at this level again. But, you know, this is not a new virus that was first identified in the in the 60s. So the big thing to remember that we want you to take away from this is as we move through this continuum of care during this period of crisis, during hospitalization, um, people are going to be coming into the home care arena. And we've got to pre be prepared not only for now, but in the future to continue to care for COVID-19 patients. Um, there are some good um, resources out there. Um, resources are continuing to be developed all the time, you know, so it is something that you want to be able to um, filter and go through about what you need. And sometimes that's hard because there is a lot of information out there. But immediately what you do need to do, as we've talked about, is revise your policies and procedures. Review them, revise them as necessary, not just for this period of crisis, but for the future as well. Maintain any documentation where you are deviating from your practice regarding the waivers. Um, you know, you want to make sure a surveyor who comes out to survey you six, nine, ten months from now, you know, that they understand that you didn't do your soup visits in the home every 14 days because of the waiver. It may sound, you know, we're living it right now and it's on everybody's mind, but hopefully, you know, 10, 
12 months from now, maybe it won't be on the forefront of our mind anymore. And again, there is a lot of information out there. CMS does have um, information, and I put their website there as well for emergency preparedness responses So, um, and the waivers. There are also the 1135 waivers as well as your state-by-state -state Medicaid waivers. So it's a good resource to get all of your information in one place regarding the waivers. And we, we know that um, we're data-driven. Um, society at this point. And so um, there's a ready tool that allows us to continue to really look at um, how well we're doing with meeting our um, expect, um, meeting the expectations of our of our patients and really measuring their experience with our organizations. Um, and I'm sure um, top of mind is the fact that CMS put out a memo um, suspending the quality uh, programs, which uh, is the home health compare um, caps and uh, star ratings uh, can be inferred because those are calculated based on that. Um, I think in a way it's really optional. Um, they said they've they're they're not having the data count, but they continue to receive that um, data. Um, it just won't count towards um, payments, and so. We can use the information, though, during this time to see how well we're doing. And we just wanted to highlight just a, a, a few uh, areas. Um, these are the areas that all the questions are grouped into. At least the first th three are uh, the composites or groupings, and the last two are specific um, questions. And so um, just going back and taking a look at those questions, um, these are the care of patients, uh, questions with responses. But just using an example of one question here, where in the last two months of care, how often did the providers from this agency seem informed and up-to-date about all the care treatment that you as a patient got at home? Um, and so we have an opportunity to really um, prepare for the visit, um, ask the questions that we need to by screening, um, select the appropriate PPE, uh, and walk in. And if we need to, um, use telehealth um, in order to take care of our patients and helping educate them on why we're using the particular method that we're using. At the end of the day, it's did we appear informed and up to date about what they needed during this period of time? And then obviously um, with communication, communication is huge. We mentioned we've mentioned it throughout. Um, you know, did someone from the agency tell them what care services they would receive? So we have an opportunity to have discussions with those patients ahead of time. Um, it might be someone who's trained in the office who has a script um, when we're going in, um, selecting the appropriate PPE and giving them a real quick education around that while we're putting it on, but ensuring that they understand um, what it is we're doing to care for them. And obviously, um, here's another example, uh, and it really does boil down to really educating them um, about what it is they need to do to either remain safe or to take their medications um, or what it is we're doing to help move them along. And then in order to um, get the top ratings, obviously what we do in response with COVID-19 um, is instrumental with that and whether they would recommend us to others. So just a review of some of the key items that we discussed, you know, as we've said, as Andrew and I both said, in-home care providers are the experts at meeting patient challenges in the home. I mean, this is what we are trained to do. Um, this is an exceptionally challenging time, but we have to relay that confidence to our patients and caregivers so they too feel that their care is, you know, at the highest care possible. Infection control is possible in the home right now with the right tools. Um, you know, I, had, I heard somebody tell me the other day that they said, oh, bleach doesn't work on killing the coronavirus, so the Clorox wipes don't work. And I just kind of tilted my head at them. I didn't really understand what they were saying. And I actually pulled a, can a canister of the Clorox wipes, and it says right on there, kills the coronavirus, the human coronavirus. You know, people hear things and take it 
to be true. And again, as we said, listen to the experts, listen to the people in the white coats, make sure the information you are receiving and that you are giving to your patients is the correct information. They can keep themselves safe without having, you know, the the Clorox wipe or whatever in the home. Soap and water still works very well for hand washing as long as hand washing is done appropriately. Um, there are successful models for delivering exceptional care. You know, unfortunately for our home care patients, oftentimes the visit from their home care provider may be the only person they have contact with. So as Andrew said, making a phone call can go a long way in them realizing how much you care for them. So, you know, reaching out when you can, not only to your active patients, but as Andrew said, even those discharge patients, patients just touching base to see how they are. Documentation, as we all know, um, if you've been in the industry any length of time, documentation is the key for continued long-term long-term success. Um, you have to document what you've done. It's the only record that you ever have to justify the quality of care that you've delivered. And you know, delivering that exceptional care despite COVID-19 um, makes us a better organization. You know, this is really the time and not to, I don't want to say this and diminish any of what we are going through at this time, but it may be the time to really look at your processes and procedures and say, how can we do things differently? How can we deliver care differently than we've delivered it before and still do the right thing? There may be things out there that you've not thought of before. I mean, this is a different time in our history so maybe now is the time to really look at transforming some of some of those processes. And this really is it. COVID nineteen is the defining care delivery opportunity for our generation. As we've said, it it is the time to really think about what can we do, how can we do it, and putting our heads together to deliver the best possible care to um, patients and families that are who are not only. Um, diagnosed with COVID, but those that aren't who are still still fearful of, you know, transmitting or receiving or be, becoming contagious from COVID for, by people coming into the home. You know, as Andrew said, this is the time to educate them on how you are as a provider um, following infection control that you're not going to make them, make them sick because of the care that you're delivering. So Andrew, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Lisa. And, you know, um, I, I agree completely. And, uh, you know, the reality is how, how do we exceed patient expectations is to do what we've always been doing all along and just, um, just to continue doing that. Our patients rely on us um, for the care that they receive. And as long as we're doing that, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be fine. Yes, we'll, feel, we'll face challenges like Lisa mentioned. As a closing thought, we just wanted to sort of put it out there, um, you know, from the country that gave us uh, Winston Churchill, um, we, we look forward to, in the years to come, everyone looking back and taking pride at how we responded to this challenge, you know, and those who come after us will know um, that we were as strong as any generation before us and that we keep our attributes of self-discipline good humored resolve, um, you know, and really taking care of one another. Um, um, and that with that, we will continue to exceed our patient expectations and we'll do fine. I want to thank you again um, for this opportunity uh, for Lisa and I to just spend some time with you. We'll turn it back over to Molly. Thank you, Andrew and Lisa. Thank you so much for sharing such great information and your thoughts and wisdom with us today. Um, you may notice in the chat box area of GoToWebinar, we have posted the slides. If you want to grab them now, you're welcome to. Um, if not, we will be sending um, the slides as well as two additional handouts from Lisa to everybody who registered for the webinar. We will share that with the recording of the webinar as well. So we'll get that out to you shortly. Um, and we thank you all for joining us today as we 
uh, partner with ACHC to deliver um, on our mission to empower healthcare organizations and professionals with the world's best solutions and information. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you for joining our on-demand training today. Access is the only home health care technology company approved by the American Nurses Credentialing Center to offer continuing education credits and the most recommended home health software on software advice. You can watch more on-demand training videos through our industry-leading help center or at access.com where you'll find tutorials, blogs, white papers, and answers to frequently asked questions. Access. Empowering care anytime, anywhere.